good. Good evening, everybody. Praise the Lord. It's a blessing to be with us once again. Amen. Pray that everybody's been having a blessed week and a safe week. And pray that we have been continually praying for each other. And, uh, of course, of those on our sick and our shut-in list as well as uh, our church and our church family. Amen. So, we want to continue to pray for all of those who are sick and those who are shut in. And we want to continue to pray for our country as well. Now, so we on a, we're not going to belabor this. We're going to go ahead and go into our prayer. And then we're going to get after our lesson. Amen. So if you will, bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Father, we come into your presence once again to say thank you. First of all, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your wonderful care over our lives. We thank you for watching over us throughout this week and keeping us safe, dear Lord, from all harm and danger. So we just come into your presence right now asking your blessings upon us as we uh, study your word. We just pray that you will illuminate our hearts and our minds, dear Lord, that we'll be receptive to what you might have to say to us today through this lesson. So bless now as only you can bless. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. This we pray in your name for your sake. Amen. Okay, all right. Okay, let us get after the church. Now, we're going to pick back up with where we left off last week. And uh, we were dealing with, last week we were dealing with the subject of real servants do their best with what they have. Real servants do their best with what they have. And keep in mind what our subject is dealing with here, how real servants act. Okay? And we told us last week that servants don't make excuses or procrastinate or wait for better circumstances. Amen? Recall that? And we told us last week that <clears throat> servants never say, uh, one of these days or when the time is right they just do what needs to be done amen they just need to do what needs to be done now the bible says in ecclesiastes uh, chapter 11 and 4 coming from the NCV translation of the Bible which means the new century version of the Bible amen it says here in Ecclesiastes 11 and 4 where it says if you wait for perfect conditions you will never get anything done amen if you wait for perfect conditions you will never get anything done you always do what you can do at the time that you have or that's available for you to do it because tomorrow is not promised to us. Amen? Only the moment that we're in. We never know what's going to happen uh, the next 10 minutes, the next three minutes or whatever because God is in control. So always do what you can while you can as much as you can for as many as you can. Amen. All right. Now, you see, because you see, God expects us to do what we can with what we have. Okay? Wherever we are, He expects us to do with what we have, wherever we are. Amen. You see, so less than perfect service is always better than the best intentions. Are you hearing me? I said perfect service is always better than the best intentions. You see, one reason many people never serve is that they fear they're not good enough to serve. Amen? They just fear they're not good enough to serve. And, and, and that is not 
true. Everybody is good enough to serve. You see, because they have believed this lie that serving God is only for superstars. Amen. That's the biggest lie that the devil could ever put in your head. Even some churches have fostered that myth by making excellence an idol. Well, if you can't do this as good as such and such a person, if you can't do this as good as that person there, that person there, I mean, they can really do this and they can really do that. Whatever you do, if you do it, and you do it in the name of the Lord and do it for the right reason, it's just as good as anything anybody else can do. So don't ever fall into that trap of believing that. Amen? You see, which makes people of average talent hesitate to get involved. Amen. Well, I don't have the talent that he has. I don't have the talent she has. So, you know, I can't do anything. No, use what you have. Everything is valuable if you're doing it for the Lord. There is no such thing as menial work in the Lord, a menial service in the Lord. Amen. You see, do it. You see. So, 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 so you, you, you may have heard it said that if I can't. If it can't be done well, or it can't be done with excellence, then don't do it. You've heard that expression, if it can't be done with excellence, don't do it. Well, Jesus never said that. Please keep that in mind. Sometimes it's excuses. Jesus never, never uttered those words. Amen. The truth is, almost everything we do is done poorly. Amen. When we first start doing it, nobody never started out doing anything really perfect or great. You see, that's how we learn. That's how we learn. We must learn to practice, amen, the good enough principle. Whatever you do, it's good enough. Amen. Just be, just do it for the right reason. Amen. It doesn't have to be perfect for God to use and bless it. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know why? Because there is no such thing as perfection. Only God is perfect. So don't let that deter you from serving. Please don't understand me very carefully. You see, I would rather see thousands of regular folks in ministry than have a perfect church run by a few elite. Amen? Are you listening to what I'm saying? So, 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 so now, uh, l let me just switch gears just for a moment here. You see, let me switch gears just for a moment. You see, God want us to have freedom and fulfillment. That's what he wants for us. He wants us to have freedom and he wants to have fulfillment. So, so, so let's unpack a little bit more. You know, I told you we were going to get back to it, but I, I want to unpack a little bit more of this uh, chapter 8 of Romans, if you will. All right, would, would, would you would you go there with me for a moment? Now, some of you here might be, some of you might be listening to me, might be history buffs, and some of you might have been around during this time. And I want to share something with you here, and it's a quote here I want to share with you. It, it, on January the sixth, nineteen forty-one. All right, President Franklin Delano Delano Roosevelt. Uh, he addressed Congress on the state of the war in Europe. And, and much of what he said that day has been forgotten. Okay? But at the close of his address, he said that he looked forward to a world founded up on four essential freedoms. And then he went ahead and named them. Amen. He said, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, and freedom of want, and freedom from fear. Amen. So, so these words are still remembered, even though their ideals have not yet been realized everywhere in the world. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So, so now here in Romans 8, is the Christian declaration of freedom. 
So, so for, for, for in it, Paul here, he declares that four spiritual freedoms that we enjoy because of our union with Christ. Amen. Now, a study of this chapter here, it shows the emphasis on the Holy Spirit, who is mentioned 19 times in this chapter. Amen. Right here in uh, 2 Corinthians, if you, if you got your Bibles and follow, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 17. Amen. Look what it says here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 17 says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So we are free from judgment. So we're free from judgment. Uh, here in uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 4 in the New King James uh, translation of the Bible here. Look what it says. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but to the spirit. Verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4. That the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit amen now Romans 3 and 20 please listen carefully here Romans 3 and 20 shows the therefore of condemnation Romans 3 and 20 it shows the therefore of condemnation but Romans 8 and 1 it gives the therefore of no condemnation amen the therefore of no condemnation which is a tremendous truth and the conclusion of a marvelous argument here now the word the word here who walk not etc the word who walks not it do not belong here according to the best manuscripts, okay? There are no conditions for us to meet. There's no condition for us to meet because you see, the basis for this wonderful assurance is the phrase here in Christ Jesus. Okay? That's the basis for it, the phrase here, in Christ Jesus. Amen? Because you see, in Adam, we were condemned. In Christ, there is no condemnation. Amen? So, so the verse does not say no mistake or no failure or even no sins. Christians do fail and we make mistakes and we do sin. Amen? We do all of those things. Adam lied about his wife. That's sin. David committed adultery. That's sin. Peter tried to kill a man with a sword. That's sin. So to be sure, they, they suffered consequences of their sins. Please listen to me carefully. We will always suffer the consequences of our sin. Amen? But they did not suffer condemnation. Please listen. Because you see, the condemns, but if you are a believer, then you have a new relationship with the law. And therefore, we cannot be condemned. That ought to make somebody real happy. That ought to make somebody just jump up and want to shout. Amen. Now, Paul made three statements here about the believer and the law. All right. And together they add up to no condemnation. Now, you see, the law cannot claim us. The law cannot claim us. 
Look at what it says here in verses 2 here of this 8th chapter of our text. Look what it says. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. It has made us free from the law of sin and death. Why? Because we have made, we have been made free from the law of sin and the law of death. We've been made free of that. That's the whole purpose of the cross. That's the whole purpose of Jesus going to the cross, taking all of that dirt, all of that filth, all of that sin upon him to free us from sin and to free us from death. Amen? Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? It's already been won at the cross. Amen? You had some say, at the cross, at the cross, where I first found Jesus. Amen? Listen, we now have life in the Spirit. We now have life in the Spirit of Jesus Christ. We have moved into a whole new cipher of life in Christ. You see, the law of sin and death is what Paul described there in Romans chapter 7, if y'all recall, when we unpack that. Right, Romans chapter 7, verse 7 through 25. The law of the spirit of life is described now here in Romans chapter 8. Amen? So, so the law no longer has any justification over us. None whatsoever. Romans 7 and 4 he said we are dead to the law and free from the law. According to Romans 8 and 2. Okay? Verse 3 says the law cannot condemn you. The law cannot condemn you. Why? Because Christ has already suffered that uh, condemnation. He had already suffered it for us on the cross. You see? So, so the law could not save. The law can only condemn. But God sent his son to save us and to do what the law could not do. Are you with me? So Jesus said, Jesus did not come as an angel. He came as a man. Amen. He did not come in sinful flesh. For that would be made him, that would make him a sinner. He didn't come in no sinful flesh. He came pure. Amen. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh as a man. He bore our sins in his body on the cross. Amen. Because you see the law of double jeopardy states that a man cannot be tried twice for the same crime. Okay? You can go out and kill somebody. Be tried for that crime. Amen? But you cannot be tried a second time for the same crime. Are you listening to me? They call that double jeopardy. So since Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins, and since we are in Christ, God will not condemn us. He will not condemn us. That, that's why it's so difficult for me to understand at this, at this level in my life why anybody that understands this would not want to be a Christian. Amen? Why anybody that understands what we're talking about now, what I'm sharing with us, would not want to be a Christian, would not want to be a child of God. Verse 4. Verse 4 says, the law cannot control you. Amen? Verse 4 says, the law cannot, verse 4 says, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us 
who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Amen. In other words, you see, as believers, we live a righteous life. Not a perfect life, but a righteous life. And we are only righteous in Jesus Christ. There is no righteous in us apart from Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. So you see, as believers, we live a righteous life. Not in the power of the law, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because you see, the law does not have the power to produce holiness. The law don't have the power to produce that. It can only reveal and condemn sin. But this indwelling Holy Spirit enables us to walk in obedience to God's will. Amen. Why you say that? Well, you see, the righteousness that God demands in his law is fulfilled in us through the spirit. Are you with me? You see, amen, it's fulfilled through us, through the spirit's power because we have no power within ourselves. Only through the power of the Holy Spirit do we have power. So in the Holy Spirit, we have life and we have liberty. Okay, according to Romans 8 and 2. And, and, and then the, the, the pursuit of happiness, as he tells us in Romans uh, 8 and 4. You see, the legalist, the legalist tries to, to, to only, or rather the legalist tries to obey God in his own strength. And then fails to measure up to the righteousness that God demands. Amen. You see, so the spirit led Christian as he or she yields to the Lord. Okay, they experience the satisfying work of the spirit in his or her life. Please listen very carefully to me today. For it is God that worketh in you. I say it's God that worketh in you. Both to do what? To will and to do of his good pleasure. According to Philippians chapter 2, 13. Amen. So, it is this fact here that leads to the second freedom that we enjoy as Christians. All right? So, you see, we have freedom from what? From defeat. We have no obligations to the old nature. We have absolutely no obligation whatsoever to the old nature. Go with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 5. And we want to look at, uh, I, mean, I said Romans chapter 8, I'm sorry, chapter 8. And we want to look at verses 5 through 17. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 17. Are you ready? I'm reading from my new King James. Look what it says. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 
Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as have been led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit so that we are children of God. Verse 17, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. That we might be glorified together. If we suffer with him, we will be glorified together with him. That is so powerful. Amen. That is so powerful. Uh, so, so now, now look here. So, so, so you see here, uh, verses twelve says, "Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh." Amen. We're not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. There is no obligation to the old nature. We have none to the old nature. Whatever that old nature was back there, it's back there. You have absolutely no obligations to that. Amen? Because you see, we can live in victory. We're living in victory now. Because so so so, so in the, in this section here, Paul describes life on three different levels here. And, and he encouraged us to live on the highest level. Amen? On the very highest level, you see. Now, just so we're clear, please listen, just so we're clear. Here in verses 5 through 8, what we just read from in this 8th chapter, Paul is not describing two kinds of Christians here. Please understand that. One kernel and one spiritual. No, he is contrasting. He's contrasting here the saved and the unsaved. Please understand that. He's contrasting the saved and the unsaved. Now, there are four contrasts. Okay, there are four contrasts. Okay, in the flesh and in the spirit. Right, and, and, and it's fifth verse. But first, I, I want to teach just a bit more, if you will, just continue to, 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 to read what we just went over here. But first, I, I want to con, uh, continue to teach just a little bit more because, see, when, when you, when we, uh, everything that we just talked about here, then it should, shouldn't be difficult for us, for us to be servants. It shouldn't be difficult for us to want to be servants or to serve. Amen. So, so that's what I want to talk just a little bit more about here in the little time that I got left here. Amen. On how real servants do every task with equal dedication. Amen. How servants, every servant do their task with equal dedication. So whenever they do, or rather whatever they do, Amen. Servants do it with all of their heart. Whatever they do. If you see a true servant, they're going to pull their heart into whatever it is that they do. I know uh, my mother used to tell me when I, was, when I was a kid, she used to say, whatever you do, you do it the very best way that you can. You do it, your, you give it your very, very best. She said, whatever it is, you do your very best. She said, because when you do that, you're putting your signature on it. You're saying that I did this. And you want it to be the very best that you can make it be. Amen. And that's what a servant does, a dedicated servant. You see, the size of the uh, the size of it is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what, how big or how small it is. That, that's not relevant. Amen. The only issue is, does it need to be done? Does it need to be done? Amen. You see, 
if it's nothing but, you know, uh, picking up paper off the floor or, or if it's just mopping the floor or, or washing the dishes or whatever it is. Amen. Whatever it needs to be done. It's important. Listen, you will never arrive at the state in life where you where you are too important to help with menial tasks. You'll never arrive. Amen. God will never exempt us from the mundane. He will never do that. Amen. It's a vital part of our character curriculum. A very vital part. The Bible says if you think that you are too important to help someone in need, you are the only, you are only fooling yourself. Amen. You are really a nobody. All right. Galatians chapter six and verse three says, "For if a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself." Okay. You see, it is in these small services that we grow like Christ. All right. Now, if you notice, Jesus specialized in menial tasks that everyone else tried to avoid. And let me give you a quick example here, and then we're going we're gonna to close it off for today. Okay, let me give you an example. One was washing feet. Jesus didn't think it was, he was too, you know, that was too menial for him was to wash feet. And then the other one was helping children. Fixing breakfast and serving lepers and so forth. Nothing was beneath him. And it should nothing should be beneath us as well. Because he came to serve. Amen. It wasn't in spite of his greatness that he did these things, but because of it. Okay? And he expects us to follow his example. All right? He expects us to follow his example. And right there where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to break it off right there. And uh, next week we're going to come back and we're going to finish talking about this. Okay? And remember, throughout the week, if you see someone, or if you see a need that needs to be done, or if you see you can help someone, don't hesitate. That might be the last thing you do in life. Amen? Amen? That might be the last thing that you do in life. Never resist an opportunity to help someone else. Okay? All right, that's my lesson for us today. Now, come back with me next week, and we're going to finish uh, unpacking this here and, and see what God got to tell us next week. Okay? All right, I hope this lesson is, is uh, being... Uh, making sense to us and I hope it's being edifying to us and I hope it, that we are using it and, and using it for the glory of God because if we sit here and listen to these lessons and, and, and study these lessons and so forth and then just don't find nothing in them that we can do to uh, improve on our lives then we're wasting our time. Amen? All right. Now, as I said always, we don't ever close out our lesson without somebody who might be watching us in this media uh, who don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. So we want to offer you that offer. We want to offer you that that opportunity right now. Amen. If, you, if that's you and you know that you're not saved and you know that you need to be saved and everybody needs to be saved, I, I want to offer you that opportunity right now. Just pray this prayer and say, Lord, I confess with my mouth that I am a sinner and that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for my sins and he rose on the third day. I believe that you are who the Bible says you are and that is the one and only living God. Amen. Would you come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior? I believe if you pray that prayer and believe it in your heart, Jesus will come in and he will seal you. And you'll be saved for the rest of your life. He made us two promises in the Bible. And there are several others. But the first two he gave us is in Romans 10, 13. He said, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. 
whoever calls on the name of the Lord. And then it, in Acts 2 and 21, he says, whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those are promises. And God said he is not a man that he can lie. Amen. Nor a man that he should repent. So if God said it, you can believe it. So if you pray that prayer and believe it in your heart, and the key here is belief. Believe it in your heart, and you will be saved. If you die tonight, you go straight to heaven. Amen? Okay. God bless you. God keep you. May his face shine upon you, and you have a blessed rest of the week. And come back with us next week, and let us finish unpacking uh, our lesson. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you once again for the wonderful privilege to come into your presence. We thank you for what you have shared with us in your word today, O oh Lord. And we pray, O oh God, that if, that if that sinner who might have been just happened to be listening to us today, the Lord, and don't know you as the free pardon of their sin, we ask you to move upon his spirit, dear Lord, and let him know, Father, that you are the one and only living God, and that they always, that they need a savior, and you are that savior. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved, and that man is Christ Jesus. So bless now, O oh God, as only you can, and watch over us throughout this week, and bring us back next week at the next appointed hour that we may continue to study your word. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you for every spiritual blessing that you give us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This we pray in your name and for your sake. Amen. God bless you, God keep you, and y'all have a blessed week, and we'll see you next week. God bless you.